I am presenting Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 7, Sunday, October 16th, 2022. The lesson is entitled, Obedience on the Day of Atonement. Lesson text comes from Leviticus chapter 16, verses 11 through 19. Related scriptures are Leviticus 23, 26 through 32, Numbers 29, 1 through 7 through 11, Hebrews 9, 1 through 28, and 10, 1 through 18. The place is Mount Sinai. The time is 1445 B.C. Atonement is one of the hardest doctrines of scripture to communicate, for it is outside the thinking of most of us. We understand debt and the repayment of debt, but atonement is something beyond that, including a cleansing from sin. We know that an individual act that God considers sinful leaves us with something between ourselves and God. But what is that thing, and how are we to handle it? We may try to just forget about it, but we know we did it, and God cannot just forget it. It must be handled. Many of your students may be struggling with this idea of something between God and me. Giving them scriptorial help with this will be a great blessing. It would be a great teaching tool to have a large drawing of the layout of the temple showing the altar, the altar of incense, the veil, and the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Today's aim, facts, to see how and why atonement was made in the ritual described here. Principle, to understand that atonement will help us understand the personality and thoughts of God. Application, to live daily with the understanding that our lives have been atoned for and are no longer held against those who trust in Christ. Illustrating the lesson. Those who trust in Christ find cleansing from sin. Practical points. One, sinners are responsible for seeking God for forgiveness of their sin. Leviticus 16, 11 through 12. Two, sin always leads to death. Atonement for it must be made. Leviticus 16, 13, Romans 6, 23. Three, Sin is so serious that it required the shedding of blood for its remission. Leviticus 16, 14 through 15, Hebrews 9, 22. Four, sin taints, taints everything it touches. Leviticus 16, 16. Five, only the one designated by God could enter into his presence to make intercession. Verse 17. Six, an imperfect system required continual observance. A better way has been made. Leviticus 16, 18 through 19, Hebrews 10, 1, 11 through 12. Golden text. He shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. Leviticus 16, 16. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is atonement for the high priest, Leviticus 16, 11 through 14. The second is atonement for the people, Le Leviticus 16, 15 through 17. And the third is atonement for the altar, Leviticus 16, 18 through 19. Introduction. Sin is a revolt against God's holy and sovereign will and it therefore destroys all fellowship with him. To try to restore this fellowship through religious observance or good deeds is useless, for these leave the root of the problem untouched. The unregenerate human heart, tainted by sin since Adam's fall, can never produce deeds to win God's acceptance. But the Bible unfolds the story of God's grace, by which he takes the initiative and provides forgiveness to sinners who trust him. But how did those who lived before the death of Christ restore fellowship with God? God provided means that prefigured Christ's atoning death. For Israel, he provided for the whole nation the annual day of atonement. Atonement for the high priest, Leviticus 16, 11. 
And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. And shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Verse 12. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Verse 14, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. The day of atonement, Yom Kippur, observed on the tenth day of the seventh month, was the only fast day among Israel's annual festivals. The Lord commanded that it shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, Leviticus 23, 27. It was a Sabbath on which no work could be done. The people were expected to spend a full 24 hours sorrowing over their sins, verses 28 through 32. The high priest played a central role in the tabernacle services prescribed for this day, and an awesome responsibility rested on him. The context of our passage deals with the deaths of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 16, 1, 10, 1-2. In light of their fatal indiscretion, possibly in entering the most holy place, Aaron was warned not to enter it at any time except at the Lord's appointment and in the proper manner. As revealed later in chapter 16, verses 29 through 30, this was to be on the annual day of atonement. The sin offering killed, Leviticus 16, 11. The high priest, having washed his body and put on special linen clothing for the occasion, had to approach the sanctuary with the designated sacrifices, verse 10 through 3 through 10. One of these was a bull to be offered as a sin offering for himself and his household, verse 11. Being a mediator between God and a sinful people, he first had to cleanse, be cleansed from his sin's pollution. So his first act was to kill the bull and offer it on the altar of sacrifice. The incense offered, Leviticus 16, 12, 13. Next, the priest was to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord. Censers were fire pans, usually made of copper or bronze, but sometimes of gold, Exodus 27.3, 2 Chronicles 4.22, and no doubt attached to a long handle. The coals were not the mineral coal that is mined and burned today. They could have been charcoal, but more likely here, they were live wood embers. The priest also was to take handfuls of sweet incense, beaten small, Leviticus 16, 12, that is finely grounded. Incense was an aromatic compound of gums and spices made to be burned, especially in religious services. The Lord had specified for Israel's worship a mixture of Sakti and Annika and Galbium with pure frankincense, Exodus 30, 34. No other mixture was to be substituted for it, verse 9. And no one was permitted to use it for personal purposes, verses 37 through 38. The high priest was commanded to burn incense daily, morning and evening, on the altar of incense located in front of the veil, separating the holy place from the most holy place, Exodus 31 through 8. But on the Day of Atonement, he was to carry the incense along with the hot embers into the most high holy place itself. There, setting the fire pan with the hot embers on the floor, he would put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, Leviticus 16:13. This not only released the aroma, but also caused a cloud of smoke to fill the inner sanctuary. It covered the mercy seat that is upon the testimony. 
The references here are to aspects of the Ark of the Covenant, the sole piece of furniture in the most holy place, Exodus 25, 10 through 12. It was a wooden chest overlaid with gold inside and out. The cover of the ark was made of solid gold, verse 17, and was called the mercy seat, Leviticus 16, 13. This is not a literal translation. The Hebrew term is related to the word atonement and really means place of atonement. On the two ends of the mercy seat are actual part of it were two cherubim of gold with wings outstretched and facing one another. Their gaze was directed downward toward the cover of which they were apart, Exodus 25, 18 through 20. The Lord chose to commune with Israel from between the cherubim, verse 22. This was thus the most hollow place in the tabernacle. The testimony in Leviticus 16, 13 refers to the tablets of the Ten Commandments, that were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 25, 16, 21, 31, 18. They are also called the Covenant, 2 Chronicles 6, 11. So the Ark is referred to alternately as the Ark of the Testimony and the Ark of the Covenant. The tablets were the heart of God's covenant with Israel and his testimony against them if they should prove disobedient. The purpose for covering the mercy seat with smoke from the incense was to prevent the high priest's death. The glory of the love, the Lord is so overwhelming that no one can look upon it and live. Exodus 33.20, Isaiah 65, John 1.18, 1 Timothy 6.16. The cloud of incense covered the area where God's presence resided, and this mercifully shielded the high priest. The blood sprinkled, Leviticus 16, 4. Having offered the incense in the most holy place, the high priest returned to the courtyard and the altar of sacrifice. From there he took some of the blood of the bull he had offered as a sin offering for himself. He brought it into the most holy place where he sprinkled some upon the mercy seat eastward, that is, toward the front of it. Then he sprinkled more unto the ground seven times in front of the mercy seat. Since this was the only time in the year when the high priest was permitted to enter the most holy place, it was the only occasion when blood was sprinkled in it. Hebrews 9, 6 through 7. At all other times, the blood of the sin offering was sprinkled in front of the veil, not inside it, Leviticus 4, 6, and 17. But on this day, the blood of the sacrifice was brought into direct contact with God's presence. This atoned for the sins of the priest, an act unnecessary for the sacrifice of Christ, the perfect high priest, Hebrews 7, 26 through 28. Atonement for the people, verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is, for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place, until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. The sin offered presented, Leviticus sixteen fifteen. Having atoned for his own sins, the high priest was to kill the goat of the sin offering, that is, for the people. He initially was to set aside two kids of the goats, one goat for a sin offering, verse 5. Bringing both of them to the door of the tabernacle, he was to cast lots upon them. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat, verse 8. The goat on which the Lord's lot fell was to be sacrificed as a sin offering. The other was to be sent into the wilderness, verses 9 through 10. 
The ceremony concerning the live goats is not included in our lesson text. It was the final phase of the priest's duty for the day. But this text outlines his duties regarding the sacrificed goat, how he was to take his blood into the most holy place as he had the blood of the bull. There he was to sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of it as before to atone for the sins of the whole nation. The tabernacle cleansed, Leviticus 16.16. 16. But the sin offering did more than atone for the people. It was to make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. Even the divine sanctuary had been polluted by the sins of those who worshipped there, so it had to be cleansed. The transgression and sins here mentioned included only those committed unintentionally and inadvertently. No atonement existed for defilement sin. Numbers 15, 27 through 31. The term holy place at the beginning of Leviticus 16, 16 most likely refers to the most holy place where the sprinkled blood of both bull and goat had been applied, verses 14 through 15. But the tabernacle of the congregation in verse 16 refers to the entire edifice, including the outer chamber where the lampstand, table, and altar of incense stood. How this cleansing was to be done is not stated. Perhaps it was by applying the blood to the altar of incense, so cleansed the edifice would remain even among the unclean. Thus, we are reminded that we, like Israel, contaminate everything with which we come in contact. Our sins make imperfect our actions, relationships, organizations, and possessions. Even our spiritual relationships and places of worship are tainted by our sins. Unlike Israel, we do not have an annual day to cleanse them, but we must constantly claim the cleansing of the blood of Jesus shed as the sacrifice for our sins. Only as we do, so can we enjoy his presence in our lives. The high priest isolated, Leviticus 16, 17. During the entire procedure, only the high priest was permitted inside the tabernacle. He was the one solitary individual who could represent Israel before God on this day. Only he had been washed and properly attired. Only he had the proper sacrifices, incense, and blood. And once the holy places had been cleansed, the entrance of an unqualified person would only have polluted them again. No doubt this was a lonely task for the high priest who bore the full weight of responsibility that day. There was no room for error as he mediated between his people and God. Yet it was his to do. No one else could share his burden. The, the, the aloneness prefigured the isolation that would be Jesus' lot as he faced the task of atoning for the sins of the world. He was the high priest who offered himself as the sin offering for all mankind. No one else was qualified to assume either of those two roles. 1 Timothy 2, 5-6, Hebrews 9, 11-12. He felt this isolation keenly as he neared the time of his death, Matthew 26, 36 through 46. And on the cross, he suffered an alienation none of us can begin to fathom, 27, 46. Atonement for the altar, verse 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it, and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Verse 19. And he shall sprinkle of the two blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. The horns purify. Leviticus 16, 18. The final act of cleansing is now described. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. Scholars different, differ as to which of the two altars is meant here. The altar of incense or the altar of sacrifice. The context favors the altar of sacrifice to which the priest would have to go out after atoning for the tabernacle. 
The phrase before the Lord is also used elsewhere to speak of this altar. 1, 3, 5, 4, 24. How ironic that the very altar on which atoning sacrifices had been offered all year should have, should have to have atonement offered for it on this day. The priest first was to take some of the blood from both the bull and the goat and place it on the horns of the altar. Horns were symbols of strength and honor. The two altars in the tabernacle had horns on their four corners signifying God's power. The altar of sacrifice itself, a symbol of both God's justice and his grace, culminated in four horns indicating the divine power to forever to forgive sins. The blood sprinkled, Leviticus 16, 19. The high priest also took some of the sacrificial blood and sprinkled the altar with it seven times to cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Thus, the mercy seat, altar of incense, and altar of sacrifice all received the atoning blood for cleansing from the defilement that came from Israel's sins. The sevenfold sprinkling, no doubt, symbolizes the completeness of the purification. This was not the end of the ceremony. Even though our lesson text does not include reference to the second goat, we should comment on what was done to it. After the high priest finished purifying the holy things, he placed his hands on the live goat's head, confessing over it Israel's sins. He then sent it away into the wilderness with someone who was specifically chosen to, to take it. This symbolized the removal of Israel's sins from God's sight. Leviticus 16, 20 through 22. Thus, the Day of Atonement beautifully portrayed the grace of God toward his people, not only cleansing them through shed blood, but also removing sin from his sight. But as striking as this picture is, it was imperfect and temporary, only prefiguring a complete and final atonement. The writer of Hebrews stated this truth clearly when he contrasted the yearly sacrifices with the, with the final sacrifice of Christ for our sins, 9, 24 through 28. The fact that the ceremony had to be repeated annually proved that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins, 10, 1 through 4. They just postponed God's judgment, a judgment that eventually fell upon Jesus and ended the annual cycles verses 11 through 14. Those who trust his saving work enjoy an access to God that Israel never knew, verses 19 through 22. Questions 1. How did the Day of Atonement differ from Israel's other feasts? 2. How did the high priest prepare for his duties this day? How did he atone for his own sins? 3. How, describe how and where the high priest offered incense. Four, what were the mercy seat and the testimony? Five, how did the incense save the high priest's life? Six, what sin offering was required for the people of Israel? Seven, why did the tabernacle require purification? Eight, why did the high priest carry out his duties alone how did this prefigure the work of Christ? 9. What was signified by the four horns of the altar? 10. Of what New Testament truth was the Day of Atonement a picture? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, October 16, 2022. Thank you for listening. God bless.